And good evening. Are the Russians looking for peace or buying time? We begin top story tonight with the talks underway in Europe, offering a glimmer of hope more than a month into Russia's war on Ukraine. Leaders from both sides meeting face to face in Istanbul. Russia pledging to drastically reduce its offensive in the cities of Kyiv and Cherniv in the West. Ukraine calling for all foreign troops to leave its borders. Russia conceding an area of the country where it has already experienced considerable losses. Ukraine regaining control of this suburb outside of the capital city. Troops there surveying the damage. But cities in the south still under constant bombardment. Russia striking a government building. The smoke from that blast clouding a surveillance camera. You see it there. At least 12 people killed in the bombing. With every hour that these peace talks drag on, the civilians on the ground still suffer. Richard Engel has one man's tragic tale of survival and loss. He lists it off again tonight from Kharkiv. The new talks between Russia and Ukraine began with deep mistrust. No handshake, but after four hours, the most significant progress so far. Russia's deputy defense minister announcing Russian troops would drastically reduce activity in central Ukraine around Kyiv and the city of Chernihiv. Ukrainian officials saying no foreign troops, all have to leave Ukraine. But that Ukraine would negotiate on the future status of Russian-backed separatist areas in Donbass, leave open the issue of Russian-held Crimea, and critically accept neutrality, not pursuing NATO membership, in exchange for international security guarantees. But is it real progress or a trap? Russia only agreed to scale back in areas where it was already suffering heavy losses. And in the east, Russia continues to bomb civilians indiscriminately, in Mariupol and in Kharkiv, where today Andre was recovering in the hallway of a hospital. Only there, because Russian bombs blew out the hospital's windows. Andre says he was escaping his home when suddenly... I heard the whistle and then I lost consciousness. Badly injured in his leg, he says he somehow managed to get his wife and daughter into their car. But as they were leaving, Russian forces hit the moving car. His wife, Tetiana, 24 years old and studying to be a hairdresser, told him, I'll be with you forever. They would be her final words. Andre was recovered by Ukrainian troops. His injured daughter was taken by relatives. He has no idea where. His wife's remains are still in the car. Too dangerous to reach her. I, I can't even imagine how that must feel. I also can't express what's happening inside of me. It feels like a dream, a nightmare but I can wake up while my wife cannot. He only has one picture of her with him, but he can't bear to look at it. <laughs> Tom, here in Ukraine, there is deep skepticism about Russia's promise to scale back its military activities, with many believing that it's just a way for Russia to buy time so it can rearm its troops and move them away from Kyiv, where they haven't been terribly effective, and potentially send them further out here in the east. And I can tell you tonight in this city, Kharkiv, there has been more intense Russian incoming fire tonight than in previous days. Tom? Richard Engel, with all the realities of the war tonight there, Richard, thank you. For more on Russia's possible military strategy, we want to take a look at the war map tonight and bring in NBC News analyst and Medal of Honor recipient Colonel Jack Jacobs. Colonel, great to have you on Top Story tonight. I want to tell our viewers just briefly what they're looking at here. This is the latest Russian attacks and troop locations as of tonight. When you see these little white arrows, that's where Russian forces are moving. The gray areas are contested areas between Ukraine and Russia, and of course the red areas are areas currently controlled by Russia. Colonel Jack, I want to start in the capital, Kyiv, and Cherniv, just north of Kyiv. These are the two areas the Russians claim they're now pulling back troops. Now, our Department of Defense doesn't buy this. They think that they're maybe sort of regrouping. What's your take? You know, I think they are regrouping. Uh, first of all, they have not been able to take Kyiv, and they can't get to the south and encircle it because of Ukrainian resistance in the east and west. So they're pulling forces out. Some of them are going to go back to Russia because they've taken a lot of casualties. Other forces are going to be moved to the east 
to renew the attack on the east in the Donbass region. Your take is because of all these attacks here in Kyiv, these battles that have not gone their way, they're essentially buying time right now. They may be telling the world, hey, we're pulling back troops, but you think they're just going to regroup because eventually the goal is to combine the north and the south. Boy, they'd really like to do that, but they got to get past Kyiv to do that. They have to get up north from Crimea to do that, and they have to fight in the center of the country. But if they do that, they'll be able to isolate the Ukrainian army in the east and make it much more difficult for us to resupply them. You mentioned Crimea. We've done a lot of reporting on Odessa as well. Let's head over down now to the south. Uh, we'll, we'll just go down here because the map doesn't seem to be working. What's what's so important down here? You think there's a, there's a land bridge they essentially want to connect? Yeah, two things. First is to link up with the forces in the north, if they can do it, and bifurcate the country. But the other is to seize all of Ukrainian Black Sea coasts. The Russians want to control all of that. It permits them easy access of their navy through the Black Sea, and it doesn't permit Ukraine to either get resupplied from sea or to evacuate civilians. If your theory is right and they, they want to take over this area, they have a lot of the east right now. Do you think essentially they're going to try to redraw the borders here and say this area to the right of the black line, all this area to the east of Kiev, that is now Mother Russia? Boy, it sure looks like that. And it gives them, if they're going to go actually into negotiations, I mean real negotiations, it'll give them some leverage because they ha will have already seized that property. But it remains to be seen whether or not they A, can seize it, and B, most importantly, to hold on to it. Millions at risk tonight for severe storms in the Midwest west and the southeast but first today pennsylvania authorities working to clear that deadly interstate pileup we told you about last night it killed three people after a dense snow squall dropped visibility to zero officials warning the death toll could still rise and take a look at this stunning new surveillance video showing the ef3 tornado that ripped through jacksboro texas last week that's the gym right there it slammed into the high school the gym collapsing from those devastating winds more tornadoes could be in store for the state hit hardest by last week's deadly weather. I want to bring in Al Roker. Al, you know, we're following all these sort of tornadoes and these tornado watches, and tonight's going to be another dangerous night, potentially. That's right, and really, Tom, the next 72 hours are going to be really difficult. In fact, this is a very potent storm. On the front side, storminess, we're talking severe storms, but also snow on the back side of this system. So here's what we're looking at. 20 million people at risk for severe weather from Des Moines this evening overnight down to San Angelo. Tornadoes possible. Those nocturnal tornadoes twice as deadly as the daytime ones. Here's where we're really concerned. Tomorrow, 35 million people at risk. Look at this area in red. That's a moderate risk. Just outside New Orleans, Alexandria, Tupelo, Mobile, long track tornadoes could be a big problem, ones that stay on the ground for a long time. We've got wind alerts for 75 million people now, stretching from Texas and on into Arizona, all the way into the plains of the upper Midwest. Wind gusts 40 to 50 miles per hour across a wide swath of the midsection of the country. And this is another big issue, a derecho potential. Now, what is a derecho? It is a long system. It's a long-lived windstorm produced by a line of severe thunderstorms. You can get tornadoes spinning out of these systems. Wind damage extends for hundreds of miles. This has to travel at a minimum of 250 miles, and it's got the potential for extreme long-lasting power outages. So here we go. We're looking at this system overnight, severe storms from the plains starting tonight. They ramp up from Missouri on into to Texas. Then tomorrow, here's where the derecho starts to set up, possibly from Chicago down to New Orleans. That's 900 miles. It continues east as we move on into Thursday. Scattered strong storms likely in the mid-Atlantic states. In fact, we do have a risk of severe weather on Thursday, stretching all the way from New York down into the panhandle of Florida as we watch this for 21 million people. Isolated tornadoes possible. Rainfall amounts, we're talking generally two to three inches, but down in the lower Mississippi and Ohio River Valleys could be three to four inches. And if that's not enough to add insult to injury, as the winds kick up with this, we've got the risk for a significant wildfire outbreak from northern Texas into Kansas and parts of Oklahoma. So, Tom, we have got a lot going on over the next 72 hours. All right, Al, thank you for that. We'll stay on top of all that weather track. To next, to the latest news on the COVID threat, the FDA authorizing a second vaccine booster for older and immunocompromised Americans, even as many remain hesitant to get that added protection and concerns grow about a new variant. And Thompson has the latest. 
older Americans have another chance to roll up their sleeves. The FDA today greenlighting a second booster of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines for anyone 50 and older four months after their first booster. Think of this fourth shot, the second booster, as really helping bring you back to those same levels that you had to protect against Omicron. The FDA also approved a second booster for the immunocompromised, including transplant recipients, people undergoing cancer treatment, and those with chronic conditions like lupus or rheumatoid arthritis. The age range for that group, 12 and older for Pfizer, 18 and up for Moderna. Is a second booster a sign of failure on the part of vaccines? Not at all. The second booster is just a reminder that vaccines are incredible, but they naturally decrease over time. While cases are declining in the U.S., the rate of decline has slowed. Today, the highly contagious BA2 variant is the dominant strain, accounting for 55 percent of new cases, a 20 percent jump in one week. But so far, boosters have been a tough sell. Of the 217 million fully vaccinated Americans, fewer than half, just about 97 million, got the extra shot. How much impact will this have on the spike if fewer than half got the first booster? It won't have as much of an impact on the spike itself. What it will have an impact on is how many hospitalizations and unfortunate deaths we will have. By boosting antibodies to reduce the severity of COVID. All right, Ann joins us now in studio. You know, Ann, there's going to be a lot of people out there who say, look, I got the two shots, I got the booster, I even got Omicron. Do I need to get this fourth shot? And you were just telling me there's some real data about the efficacy of getting a second booster. Yeah, doctors will tell you, you do need to get this fourth shot if you are over the age of 50, because that new variant that's out there, BA2, is highly contagious. And so you need all the defenses you can get to keep yourself from COVID. What this booster does, is it will keep you from getting the worst of the infection, from going into the hospital and potentially from dying. And is it safe? Well, the FDA points to some data out of Israel, 700,000 cases involving these fourth shots, and they say they found no new safety concerns. All right, Ann Thompson for us, Ann, thank you for that. Tonight, the stunning move to extradite former Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez, who's accused of helping drug cartels traffic cocaine to the U.S. for years. The Honduras Supreme Court voting against him and allowing the extradition to the U.S. to move forward, all of this only months after he stepped down from office. NBC's Isa Gutierrez has those details. Tonight, a historic extradition underway. The Honduran Supreme Court signs off on former President Juan Orlando Hernandez being extradited to the U.S., where he's accused of colluding with drug traffickers for political gain. The final step after the U.S. requested his extradition back in February. Video from last month capturing Hernandez's arrest outside his home after a tense standoff with police. Less than three weeks after Hernandez was unseated by Xiomara Castro after eight years in office. What was it like for you to see um, Hernandez being arrested outside of his home last month? Well, it was a shock because he was a very powerful person. When we saw him with handcuffs and, and just with that level of security around him, but not necessarily to protect him, but to detain him. Uh, that was definitely something that we did not think we would see in a short term. The end of the former president's second term tainted by controversy after his brother Juan Antonio Hernandez was sentenced to life in prison in the U.S. on drug and weapons charges last year. This after years of U.S. prosecutors in the Southern District of New York accusing Hernandez of funding his political rise with profits from drug traffickers. In exchange for protecting their shipments, including more than 500,000 kilos of cocaine since 2004, the former president has strongly denied any wrongdoing. On Monday, Hernandez's wife, Ana Garcia, released a letter on her social media appearing to be from her husband. The two-and-a-half-page handwritten note says he is an innocent victim of revenge by the drug cartels. Not long ago, former President Hernandez was considered an ally to the U.S. What does this extradition, what message does it send? Yes, for high political leaders, not just in Honduras, but in Central America, the message is that it doesn't matter how much power and the weight they have in the political landscape in their countries or in the region, once uh, they commit corruption acts or, or any other 
crime against the United States, their office uh, comes to a second stage once they become a private citizen and they are enabled to respond towards the United States justice. All right, Issa joins us now live in studio. Issa, what's next here? Can you kind of walk us through the legal steps? Sure, Tom. So that appeal was really his one shot to stop this extradition. So now that the Supreme Court rejected that, he will be extradited to the U.S. That could happen in the coming weeks, even in the coming days. Of course, Hernandez will have to go through the judicial process here in the U.S. to determine whether or not uh, he is found guilty, right? The attorney that I spoke to said, however, that we should look at what happened to his brother, Tony Hernandez, in the same process. He was tried here in the U.S., he was found guilty, and now he's facing life in prison. The attorney is saying that this should really be considered a preamble to what might happen to the former president here as well. From president to life in prison, wow, that, that would be a stunning fall from grace. Issa, thank you for that. And still ahead tonight, the conviction sending shockwaves through the medical field. A nurse charged with negligent homicide after she gave a patient the wrong drug. Why her peers are worried the criminal charges could set a dangerous precedent. Plus an update on that amusement park horror. The teen's tragic fall caught on camera. Why his family now says he shouldn't have been allowed on that ride at all. And the Foo Fighters canceling the rest of their tour after the shocking loss of their drummer. What authorities have revealed about his sudden death. Top story just getting started. Back now with a story out of Tennessee that's causing outrage within the medical community. A former nurse found guilty of negligent homicide after a patient in 2017 died from being administered the wrong drugs. Why other nurses are speaking out now, Zinclay Esamwa has more. Tonight, a former nurse found guilty of homicide for the accidental death of a patient due to a medical error. It's a scary place that we work in for a lot of reasons. The former nurse, Redonda Vaught, seen immediately after the verdict, surrounded by crying nurses outside a Tennessee courtroom. Vaught, guilty of criminally negligent homicide and gross neglect of an impaired adult. She pleaded not guilty to all charges. Nurses are outraged here. Many speaking out after the decision. I'm terrified that now I'm in a profession where, God forbid, I do make a mistake. The American Nursing Association saying it sets a dangerous precedent of criminalizing the honest reporting of mistakes, adding that some medical errors are inevitable. On Friday, a jury convicted her for injecting the paralyzing drug Vacaronium into a 75-year-old, Charlene Murphy, instead of the drug Versed, a sedative. Is this an indictment against the nursing profession and medical community? No, absolutely not. Uh, I found out very quickly that this was not about... Uh, a single mistake. The DA says there were at least 17 instances of, quote, gross neglect that led to Murphy's death. We had a jury trial, and on that jury were two health professionals, including a nurse. We don't prosecute nurses for making a mistake, but if there is uh, gross neglect, then yes, that person is going to be subject to prosecution. The AP reporting Vought admitted to making several errors in court. Her lawyer, Peter Stryance, arguing Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Tennessee is partially responsible. Who is accountable and who is responsible in cases like this? There are really two kinds of errors that take place in healthcare. One are what I'll call culpable errors, meaning you're under the influence, you're not prepared. Then there are errors that happen because the system fails. Vought's lawyer says the system did fail due to a practice of overriding the hospital's electronic medical cabinet to access the drugs. Vought seen here furthering this claim last summer before the state's nursing board. Overriding was something we did as a part of our practice every day. According to the DA, the Vanderbilt University Medical Center negotiated an out-of-court settlement with Murphy's family. It also fired Vaught, who lost her nursing license and declined to comment when contacted by NBC. We've heard from a lot of medical practitioners who say this sets a dangerous precedent. You know, anyone who assumes a duty of care over another person will be subject to prosecution if they cause harm due to gross neglect. That's not a precedent, that's the law. 
All right, Zinclay joins us now live here on set. So, Zinclay, are, are we talking about prison time here? And what is the family of that victim saying? Yeah, so we know sentencing will be May 13th. The AP says prison time could look like three to six years. But it's important that we center the voice of the family. They actually gave us a statement just a few hours ago, and they emphasized that they did not pursue charges against Ms. Vaught. And so that's an important distinction to make tonight, Tom. Okay, Zinclay, thank you so much for that. Uh, we want to turn out of the latest on the tragic story out of Orlando, a 14-year-old falling to his death off an amusement park ride. There are still questions over whether he should have even been allowed to get on that ride in the first place. Meanwhile, his family grapples with all this grief. Sam Brock has more. Tonight, new details emerging in the tragic death of 14-year-old Tyree Sampson, who fell from an Orlando freefall ride last Thursday. NBC News has obtained the operation manual for the drop tower, released by the state, which reads in part, Be careful when seeing if large guests fit into the seats. Check that they fit within the contours of the seat and the bracket fits properly. If this is not so, do not let this person ride. The ride's weight limit, per the manual, is 130 kilograms or around 287 pounds. According to Samson's father, the boy was 325 pounds. His cousin, now petitioning to have the ride closed permanently, says Samson had already been turned away that night from two other rides because of his weight. I would run for y'all to hurt his little feelings and tell him not to get on and see his life would have been still here. Slingshot Group operates the Orlando Freefall along with another ride at Icon Park. They have not yet commented on the weight restrictions or Samson being blocked from other rides. But last week, the group saying it's cooperating with authorities on the investigation and heartbroken. Safety is first for both our guests and our employees. And uh, uh, we, I've never encountered anything like this, so we are, we are devastated. Both rides at Icon Park operated by Slingshot are currently being examined. For family members and friends, a memorial builds along the attraction, now obscured in black mesh as they process the shocking loss. The hardest thing I had to do was clean his blood up. They didn't even clean it. They left it there and I had to get it up. The boy's father overcome with grief. It's still the worst day of my life. It, it, don't, it ain't gonna stop. Samson's family has retained high-profile attorneys Benjamin Crump and Bob Hillier to represent them. Hillier telling the AP in an interview, this is going to be a straight-up negligence case. There has to be redundancies. It has to be more than uh, a 16-year-old minimum wage kid walking around checking whether or not your harness works. We uh, again go go around to each individual and we ensure that that harness is locked in and and if it's not locked in the ride will not operate. On Saturday singer Dolly Parton's theme park Dollywood announced it would shut down a similar ride developed by the manufacturer of Orlando Freefall. As for now Samson's family can only mourn while they await answers to their many questions. And I just appreciate I had him as my son. I wish I was here to tell my love. All right, Sam joins us now from Florida. Sam, what else do we know about the warnings and the safety procedures, essentially the safety record of that ride? So, Tom, there was a whole batch of state records that were released today. We found out that the operator for the ride was trained on February 21st, which is just about a month before this tragedy happened. We also found out from the initial accident report that the harness itself was in a locked position down after the ride stopped. But clearly, Samson was still able to get out. And our reporters on the ground there uh, for WESH, which is the Orlando NBC affiliate, said they can find signs that say that there are height restrictions, height rules, nothing about weight, Tom. Wow, that's really interesting. It's weird that it locked in, and yet he still somehow slipped out being as, as, as large as he was. What's the status of that ride right now? So that ride, plus a second ride, a slingshot, or the slingshot is what it's called, both of them are shut down indefinitely right now. That decision comes from Icon Park, the way that it's constructed. It's essentially contracted. It's not a, a large theme park company. It's individual contractors that run the rides. Those two rides operated by Slingshot shut indefinitely until they're deemed to be safe. Right now, the Florida Department of Agriculture is investigating at this moment. All right, Sam Brock with a lot of new reporting on that story. Sam, thank you. When we come back, an update on that deadly crash in Oklahoma. A driver plowing through a homeless camp. His blood alcohol level, nearly twice the legal limit. The charges he's now facing. Stay with us. All right, back now with Top Stories newsfeed and the latest on the driver who crashed into a homeless encampment in Oregon. 
Prosecutors say 24-year-old Enrique Rodriguez Jr. had a blood alcohol content of 0.15, nearly twice the legal limit when he plowed into that encampment. At least four people were killed. He's now being held without bail on a slew of charges, including four counts of first-degree manslaughter. The Foo Fighters have canceled all upcoming shows following the shocking death of drummer Taylor Hawkins. The 50-year-old was found unresponsive at a hotel in Bogota, Colombia, on Friday, just hours before the band was set to perform. No cause of death has been released, but a preliminary report found 10 different substances in his body at the time. The band was slated to perform at the Grammys this Sunday and had a global tour with dates through the summer. All right, now to the dramatic rescue of a dog stranded in the L.A. River for hours. Take a look at this, the new video showing firefighters guiding the dog through the frigid current to shallow waters, pulling him out of the water using ladders. That dog taken to an animal shelter for treatment. The dog's owner, a man who jumped in to save the dog, also pulled from the river. The owner was taken to the hospital, no word yet on their condition. And the NFL announcing new diversity rules for hiring coaches next fall. The league saying all teams must hire a member of a racial or ethnic minority or a woman as an offensive assistant coach for the upcoming season. Last month, Commissioner Roger Godell said the league fell short of its goal during the 2022 head coach hiring cycle. And we continue our coverage with the latest from Ukraine amid ongoing peace talks and Russia claiming scaled back operations. A Ukrainian source in Istanbul told NBC News, quote, we have won the war. We now need to win peace. With that, I want to bring in NBC News foreign correspondent Kier Simmons, who joins us now from Istanbul, where those talks took place. Kier, that Ukrainian source said that this was, quote, a baby step, but the biggest step in negotiations so far. Are we to read that this is substantial progress? Yeah. I think certainly substantial progress, Tom, in these talks in the building behind me here today on the political front. For the first time, we see the Russians talking about the potential for a meeting between President Putin and President Zelensky uh, face to face. And then a whole raft of proposals made by the Ukrainians. Most of the proposals seem to have been made by the Ukrainians, including that they would adopt neutrality, a new strategic proposal for uh, Ukraine itself, where it would be uh, backed by uh, the West, it's, uh, its safety supported by the West, and then a, a long-term plan for Crimea. So politically, yes, but militarily, still a lot of fighting in Ukraine, and perhaps that's what's really crucial. Crucially, in most cases, peace talks come about and have success, Tom, when the fighting runs out, and it may be that we're not seeing that yet. And still a lot of questions, right, on what would happen to those areas in eastern Ukraine now controlled by Russia. That's one of the big questions there. Tonight, we do want to mention President Zelensky had called these talks, quote, positive. But here, there was very little trust in that room today, correct? That's, that's absolutely right. I mean, just think about this. Uh, neither side shook hands when they first met. Prior to the meeting itself, the Ukrainian foreign minister uh, said that the Ukrainian uh, group there in those talks should not drink or eat or touch any surfaces for fear uh, that they might be poisoned. So a real lack of trust. And you are right. One of the crucial questions, Tom, is going to be territory. Will Russia give up some of the territory, if you like, that it has gained? There have been no negotiations over that so far. Perhaps that will have to be when President Putin and President Zelensky meet face to face. But you can just imagine how difficult those discussions will be, Tom. Kier Simmons for us tonight from Istanbul. Kier, thank you for that. We want to stay with Ukraine. The city of Odessa on defense tonight as Russian forces continue to overwhelm key cities in the midst of peace talks. Citizens of the famed port city are hunkering down, preparing for when war reaches their doorstep. NBC's Molly Hunter has a story. The famed Odessa Opera House, now one of the most heavily fortified buildings in Ukraine. More than two centuries old, it survived two world wars. Lead choreographer Gary Savoyan says the iconic building is the city's heart and soul. What does it feel like when you walk into work into this building? The building itself urges you to create, he says. Adding, the building has a great history. It's the best theater in the world. But today, this is as close as we can get. It's now under military protection. 
And since before the war started, Odessa has been preparing. The jewel of the Black Sea nestled in Ukraine's southwest corner, the cultural center dear to so many Ukrainian hearts and historically Russian ones too. Now a fortress with monuments shrouded in sandbags. The city's famous white sand beaches, usually packed with tourists. Now, according to officials, many lined with explosive mines. We've been hearing some activity over there, but this entire beach, and you just heard it again, this entire beach is locked down. There are no civilians out here. And you heard that again right there. But this is how close this war is getting to this strategic city. According to the U.S., about two dozen Russian warships are off Odessa's coastline, blockading the strategic port home to Ukraine's Navy. One of the highest ranking Ukrainian naval officers here on shore tells us the Russian ships have been moving in and out, calling it psychological warfare. But he says the Russians are out of options. So you don't think they can take Odessa? No chance, he says. We will kill them as they approach. An estimated half the city has stayed behind to fight. Uh, if you come here, Nikolai Vakonsky heads a volunteer coordination center supporting the community here and sending vital supplies to the east. Until recently, it was a trendy food court. Uh, it was a bar with oysters and champagne. And the volunteers who work here are the same people who used to hang out here. Why are people staying? Because it's our home. I stay here because I have to support our people, our army, our civilian, and it's my duty. All right, that was Molly Hunter for us. We want to turn over now to Shanghai, the city facing a strict COVID lockdown. As cases quickly rise and chaos breaks out among residents trying to secure food, some residents saying it's worse than the onset of the pandemic. Janice Mackey Freyer has that story. Tonight, China's biggest COVID lockdown yet, bringing Shanghai to a standstill. Half the commercial capital of 26 million locked down now, the other half later this week. Residents undergoing staggered mass testing with schools, businesses and public transit closed. This is much worse than it was in terms of lockdown back in February of 2020 in Shanghai. It's much worse. <laughs> the snap lockdown triggering chaos to stock up. Videos on social media appearing to show store shelves stripped bare. With roughly 5,000 new cases in the city a day, the outbreak seems modest compared to much of the world. But the rapid spread of the BA2 variant here is testing China's zero COVID strategy to stamp out all infections. Across the country, tens of millions are locked down or unable to travel between cities. There is a fence and you are like in a cage and that's it. Here in Beijing, entire neighborhoods walled off when even a single COVID case is detected. When a community is closed, it's really closed with surveillance cameras and high fences controlling who goes in and who comes out. Two years into the pandemic, China's leadership still worries that cases will flood hospitals. In Shanghai, mild and asymptomatic cases are sent to makeshift quarantine centers instead. China's biggest risk, a vast population of exposed seniors. Upwards of 130 million people over age 60 are either unvaccinated or have had fewer than three doses, leaving stealth Omicron to challenge China's zero COVID rules that are straining the economy and people's patience too. China's government has tweaked parts of the zero COVID strategy, but there's no sign of abandoning it, even as it struggles to keep pace with the BA2 variant here. For people in Shanghai, the concern is that more testing will mean more cases in the days to come, and those higher numbers could trigger an even longer lockdown. Tom? Janice Mackey Freyer for us. Now to Top Stories Global Watch, we begin with another suspected terror attack in Israel. Chilling new cell phone video shows a man dressed in black walking around with an assault rifle in a Jewish ultra-Orthodox suburb of Tel Aviv. Police say the suspect shot in apartment balconies and then people on the street and in cars. At least five people were killed. It's the fifth attack in Israel in less than two weeks. And three people are dead after a small plane crash through a supermarket just south of Mexico City. Photos showing the airplane's fuselage. Look at that line among the scattered goods inside the store. The aircraft reportedly took off from Acapulco. All three people on board were killed. At least four people on the ground were injured. So far, no word on what caused that crash. And Queen Elizabeth making her first public appearance in five months. The queen attending a memorial service for her husband, Prince Philip, nearly one year after his death. She was escorted to her seat by her son, Prince Andrew, despite the controversy surrounding him. It's the Queen's first public event since her bout with COVID-19 last month. 
Prince Harry and Meghan notably absent amid a fight with the palace over security. When we come back, you've heard of the great resignation. Now get ready for the great regret. A record number of Americans quitting their jobs during the pandemic, but some workers now finding out, finding out the grass isn't really greener on the other side. The questions experts say you should ask before you decide to quit. Stay with us. And we are back now with Money Talks, what consumers and investors need to know from the business world and beyond. Remember the great resignation? For some Americans, it's now turning into the great regret. People fled their jobs in record numbers during the height of the pandemic. But how has it panned out? Vicki Wynn has more. Did you flirt with the idea of quitting or changing careers during the pandemic? You're in good company. Labor statistics show about 4 million employees have left their jobs every month since June. But a new poll reveals some of the workers who joined the Great Resignation wished they'd stayed put. Of 2,000 workers surveyed, one in five regrets quitting their old job, and a third are already searching for a new job. In September, Maddie Machado left her position as a recruiter at Microsoft to work for Meta, formerly known as Facebook. The new role meant a big raise from $135,000 a year to one eighty-five. That was really the only reason I left Microsoft. I love the company, I love the culture. But she says the new gig was nothing like what she expected. One of the reasons I was looking to leave was because I wanted more of an impact. Did you ever think to go back to Microsoft? About three months in, I knew it wasn't a fit. Um, so I reached out to Microsoft and was just like, can I please come back? Um, but unfortunately they didn't have any positions. Machado's experience is reflected in the poll results. 30% of workers say their new role is different from what they expected, and 24% say they didn't thoroughly evaluate the pros and cons of leaving. We know that the new boss is the same as the old boss, and a lot of times the grass is not any different on the other side of the fence. Professor Dietrich von Biedenfield studies employment trends at the University of Houston downtown. He says it's mostly younger employees driving the career changes. We're an instant gratification culture generally, but especially in that millennial Gen Z area. If you are one of these people thinking about resigning to go to a new job, what are the questions you should be asking? How many hours am I expected to be in the office versus working remote? What is my team going to look like? Ask your interviewers, when you first came, what was the most unexpected aspect of the job? He also recommends asking to shadow an employee to get a feel for the daily routine and company culture, something that's hard to gauge if you're only interviewing over Zoom. Your title may imply that you get to send out cool emails and go to fancy lunches, and the reality is you're on the phone all day answering customer complaints. As for Maddie, we spoke on her first day at a new job at LinkedIn, coincidentally owned by her old employer, Microsoft. She says she thinks it's a better fit, but it came at a cost. I did take a 20K pay cut, um, but it was worth it. You can't put a price on happiness. Vicki Wynn joins us now. Vicki, you know, I know there's some new job numbers that may give people who are experiencing the great regret a little bit of hope. Hey, Tom. Yeah, the Department of Labor says the number of available jobs ticked down to about 11.3 million last month. What that means is employers are able to hire people. This is still very much a job seekers market, but there are a few reasons people are incentivized to go back to work. One, government benefits are running out. Two, kids are back in school, so that allows parents and other caregivers to be able to get out of the house and get back into the workforce. The number of people leaving or quitting their jobs, that actually ticked up 4.4 million last month. So what that tells us is this is such a job seekers market. This is the time that you want to ask for what you need and what you want from either your current boss or the job that you're going to. Tom? Vicki, do you have a litmus test or, or any type of advice for people who maybe are currently working right now, but they're thinking about leaving and switching to another job? I always have advice. The professor you saw in that story gave us a really good tip, and he said, you know what, be patient, do your research, and once a year, set up job interviews, because that's really going to tell you what the market is like, what salaries are like out there, and it'll give you a sense of whether you should go for it or if your job is a great place to stay put. Something else that Maddie Machado told us in that story, she's uh, technically a professional recruiter. So her job is to search for, for work, right? She said, make sure that you go to sites like Glassdoor and teamblind.com where anonymous reviewers will tell you what it's like to work at a company. That gives you a real sense of what you're stepping into. Tom? Vicki win for us tonight. Vicki, we thank you for that. When we come back, surviving the storm, the teenager severely injured during a tornado strike, now walking out of the hospital, his courageous road to recovery. Next.
Finally tonight, a story of resilience and recovery. A teenager injured in a deadly tornado outbreak arrived at the hospital unable to move his legs. Now, after months of rehabs, he's taking an unforgettable step. As the tornado sirens wailed last December in western Tennessee, 14-year-old Kyle Cohen and his family ran for cover. He made the call, man. He says, keep your shoes on tonight. Their home took a direct hit from a twister that was part of the Quad State tornado outbreak. The house started dusting just a little bit, and you could see it. I was like, this is for real. I dove for the hall and no more and sat down and heard the house start splintering. And that's the last we remember until we woke up in the field. When the dust settled, the Cohen family home was gone. Right outside, Kyle was a few yards away on the ground. And he was moaning. And I said right there, I says, oh, that boy is hurt bad. I don't remember the pain so much. I just remember it was cold and it was wet. Two weeks later, Kyle was transferred to Rankin Jordan Pediatric Bridge Hospital in St. Louis. He had a fracture that involved every vertebrae in his back. He had no feeling from his umbilicus, his belly button basically down. Kyle was essentially paralyzed. Doctors told the teen his road to any type of recovery would not be easy. They'll make you do stuff that you think is really hard, but they'll make you do it. A journey made even harder by the fact he had to spend the first part of it without his family. Mom and dad were recovering from their own injuries back in Tennessee. The first time we saw him was here six weeks later. That's how long it took for us to recover enough to travel up here. But through it all, Kyle stayed strong, working hard with his doctors and nurses on his physical therapy. We knew that this was a kid that's going to fight hard. And that's what Kyle did. For three months, his life was on a treadmill, working with therapists and relearning how to walk downstairs. When word came that Kyle would be discharged, his friends and family chartered a bus to St. Louis, ready to support Kyle, whatever his condition. They even had signs that read, Welcome Home, and this one, Go Kyle. So 12 weeks after a tornado destroyed his home and his body, this is Kyle Cohen walking out of the hospital, step by step into a sea of hugs. Kyle says it happened thanks to his team of doctors, and now he's standing tall with the community that stood by him. And we want to thank our St. Louis affiliate KSDK for their help with that story. And before we go, some other good news. We'd like to introduce you to the newest member of our top story family. Our executive producer, Mike Solmson, welcoming his daughter, Margot Diane, at 8 pounds, 11 ounces yesterday. Both mom and baby are doing well. The top story team cannot wait to meet her. Thanks so much for watching Top Story tonight. I'm Tom Yamas in New York. Stay right there. More news on the way. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.